Thank you very much. Thank you for giving up your evening and, and coming along. Thank you uh, for the warm welcome. Um, yeah, it, thank you, Rainer, for inviting me. Um, I've looked at the de Havilland Comet for a number of years. I got involved probably getting on for 25 years ago when I was asked to talk about fatigue um, as part of a documentary. And it got me looking at the comet, trying to understand a bit more about it, and getting involved with some of the, the kind of the people that were involved at the time. Um, it's quite a few years now since it actually crashed, since the investigation. Um, the benefit of doing the documentaries that I did was that I managed to meet a number of the um, protagonists from the original story um, and was able to actually talk to them about the, the investigation, about the aircraft. So I'll be talking, so some of the information that I'll be giving you tonight will actually be from the, the people that were there at the time. Um, I'm not old enough to have worked on the comet myself. Um, sadly, I never flew on one. Um, so that, that's unfortunate. Um, but anyway, we'll, we'll work with that. But it's, it was a lovely aircraft. First flew in 1949. Um, absolutely beautiful aircraft. That's in, in its Air France colours. That uh, three, three aircraft went to Air, Air France. Um, I've got a particular affection for the Air France ones. The, the last remaining comet, actually, Comet 1 in, in its full glory, is painted up in BOAC colours at Cosford Aerospace Mu Museum and is actually one of the Air France comets. Um, so that's, that's where that comes in. Um, but it was a lovely aircraft, very clean lines, um, revolutionary for its day. And I think that's one of the key things about it. It really was an aircraft that put Britain at the forefront of aviation technology. And what we'll do is we'll work our way through the story. I mean, everybody knows you're in an engineering department. You mentioned the de Havilland Comet. It usually gets a comment somewhere about between comments three and five is square windows. So, so we'll go through the square window story um, and we'll work our way on from there. The general background at the time. Um, it was a bit of a, a kind of difficult time, 1940s, early 1940s, middle of the war. Um, Post-war air travel was dominated by large propeller-driven aircraft. Those were the, air, the, the, the aircraft that were kind of going to be flying at the time. The US industry actually had developed some bespoke transport airframes as part of the war effort. The UK tended to be trying to build um, bombers. And so when it got to the end of the war, the development of air transport was basically with modified bombers. So the Avro York was a Lancaster bomber with a completely different airframe strapped underneath the wings. And so they, they tended to be looking at developing hybrids, um, uncomfortable hybrids in some cases, of aircraft to actually try and get some commercial uh, interest from the airlines as uh, the, all the world's airlines started picking up and wanting to travel around the world after the war. And air travel was becoming popular. Um, not as popular quite as today, but people were expecting comfort and speed. Speed by today's standards, not necessarily that much, but they were expecting to get there in a level of comfort. They were expecting that they would, they would get around the world. Um, and to be honest, although they were propeller on the propeller driven for a lot of the um, commercial products, the military aircraft have been using gas turbine power plants since 1942, but that was only about two air forces. De Havilland themselves had quite a good pedigree in this area. Um, that's the de Havilland uh, Goblin engine. Um, they designed the Vampire, which is there, and it was the second RAF jet fighter to enter service in, in 1945, powered by one de Havilland Ghost, 3,500 pounds of static thrust, which is peanuts. That's in the loose change of today's uh, civil aircraft. Um, but equally, they've been involved in passenger aircraft. They, uh, de Havilland 4A completed the UK's first scheduled passenger flight in 1919. So they've been doing some passenger stuff, and they developed this kind of parallel track of military and passenger aircraft, m military and civil. So they, they'd got the pedigree. Um, anybody from Rolls-Royce here? Ex-Rolls-Royce. Ex-Rolls-Royce. I'm going to get in trouble now. Um, the, the Gloucester Meteor was the first aircraft to enter service with uh, the RAF in, in terms of uh, jet fighters. The Gloucester Meteor, the, the five prototypes that flew, it was Rolls-Royce powered number one, Rolls-Royce powered number two, Rolls-Royce powered number three, Rolls-Royce powered number four, de Havilland powered number five. Number five flew first because unlike every other engine, Rolls-Royce was late with the first gas turbine. <laughs> Yes, anyway, um, moving swiftly on. So, <laughs> so they, de Havilland had a, had a pedigree. And actually, their, de their design of gas turbines was much more like the Whittle patent. You actually go and pull the Whittle patent, look at it. The, the, the design that, um, de that 
uh, Bishop and his team put into that looks much more like the Whittle pattern than Whittle ever stuck to, which is interesting. They basically pulled the pattern and copied it. Whittle didn't. Um, but flight in 1942 actually kind of puts some context around this. Uh, it's a long sentence, but the whole British Empire at present time has been op an operational fleet of transport aircraft comprising conversions, makeshifts and cast-offs totally inadequate to represent the Empire in serving the air routes of the world in peace to come. And so this was, this was December 1942. Um, ha have we to rely on upon other nations to do it for us? Uh, the British aircraft industry is equal to the task. The government should decide this qu vital question at once. That's because they'd heard wind of the Brabazon Committee, which was pulled together during the war, after Winston Churchill got a trip in a Liberator bomber, a rather cold trip, to Russia in winter, I think. Um, but basically, he, ha he got very cold in a Liberator bomber and decided that if we we're going to do air, air travel after the war, we needed something that was better than this. And they set up the Brabazon Committee. And the Brabazon Committee came back in 1945 and said, we need all these different types of aircraft to be designed and built by the British uh, industry to serve a number of different sectors. And so Type 1, very large transatlantic airliner serving high volume routes, London, New York, seating its passengers in luxury for the 12 hour trip. So there's all these kind of things cropping up. Um, and it's split down into all sorts of types. Um, look, knocking in there, Type 2B, that was a bit of an argument with Vickers. Uh, for an aircraft using new turboprop engine encouraged by Vickers, that became uh, the Viscount. Lovely little aircraft, one of the best selling air British aircrafts of all time. First thing I ever flew on. Lovely. Lovely aircraft. And so that... Big oval windows. Big oval windows. That was, that was actually put in by Vickers. Uh, de Geoffrey de Havilland, who was on the Brabazon Committee, actually chipped in. Type 4 was a jet-powered, 100-seat, high-speed transport, um, and it was added at the personal urging of Geoffrey de Havilland. <laughs> Funny that. Anyway, that became the Comet. So the Comet itself, they, des they started design work on it. At type 4, high-speed mail plane was where it really comes from. Design work began in September 46. The key features that they focused on, aluminium construction, they wanted it to be as lightweight as they could make it. Hydraulic actuation of the control surfaces, now that was really radical. This was the first aircraft to use hydraulics across all primary controls, which meant no longer would the pilot's yoke be attached to the control surfaces by wires. And all the pilots of their day said, we'll lose the feel, this won't be any good. Anybody remember when Airbus launched fly-by-wire? And all the pilots said, this won't be any good. Well, the 1940s, that's what the pilots said. Wait until fly-by-light comes along and all the pilots say, we, we, it's not connected to anything, we won't have... Anyway, um, we'll just rehash the old arguments. And the reason for, for that was that they felt it was the only way they were going to fly at high speed. They needed the control, they needed hydraulics to actually make, the, make it work. It was just going to be too high speed for control surfaces. Uh, manually operated ones. Four de Havilland ghost engines, slight up rate from the goblins, 36 passengers in the initial form, range 1,750 miles point to point, so not a great range either. Cruising speed nearly 500 miles an hour, that's interesting, that's slightly higher than today's aircraft but apart from Concord which kind of sits out there on its own, isn't too far off every other commercial aircraft that's ever come since. You know 450 to 500 miles an hour and they're all in that bracket and everybody's sitting at about the same speed. Fir the first gas turbine powered aircraft was the same. Cruising altitude, 35,000 feet. Weight, 50 tonnes. Some interesting data that uh, I, I found um, put out by Frank Whittle. He basically said that his gas turbine was going to be really, really valuable. P a piston engine is there, jet's there. And, and the comet I've added at the end, but this is Frank Whittle's data looking at how the, the efficiency at high speed, sudden, you suddenly need a jet if you're going to go to high speed because your capacity load, which is the green bit at the top, has completely disappeared for piston-engined aircraft. And that was Frank's major ar argument in the 1930s and early 1940s. And actually, de Havilland bore this out. And actually, the only reason that their capacity load was there is that that's actually a slight, this, all of the these he worked out on a London to Paris stage route. So only a, an hour's flying. This was actually for two hours, so actually you could, you could put a bit back in there. So it's not far off Frank's original calculations. So de Havilland weren't exceeding what was thought of at the time as being where they would actually start to play. The data was very much in keeping with everybody else. And some of the compromises they had to make, gas turbine engines are more efficient at high altitude, hence the height. The passengers would need oxygen. 
this was going to be the first time to an extent that they'd have to go and do something like pressurised cabins to any great extent. <coughs> because the passengers above 10,000 feet, 12,000 feet, you get quite poorly if you don't breathe. Um, so you had to go and have cab, and they decided to pressurise the cabin. They could have gone the other way and given everybody face masks. They, as pilots of high altitude jets had face masks and, and separate oxygen system, systems, they decided they would pressurise the cabin. So that, that meant that the cabin had to withstand the pressure of you know, eight and a quarter PSI. And I'm sorry for some of the units I'm going to dodge in and out of. Because of the age of the project, I'm going to flip between metric and imperial at kind of random kind of intervals. Um, so that was, they basically pressurised the cockpit to the equivalent of 8,000 feet. And that's actually not been far off industry standard until the Boeing 787, which has just pushed it up, you know, pushed it down to 6,000 feet. And actually 8,000 feet was kind of the industry standard since 1952. So de Havilland set a standard in terms of speed, in terms of cabin pressurisation, that hasn't really changed. Ghost engines weren't powerful by today's standards, thrust to weight ratio of about two. You know, Trent's these days, six plus. Airframe was made as light as possible to, to keep that, that payload at its maximum. And so they used something called Redux, which is an aluminium gluing kind of technology. And the aluminium alloy they used was DTD546, which was a UK specification aluminium alloy, which is very similar to a 2000 series alloy today. So early generation aluminium alloy. Um, some stuff that de Havilland had done, the Dove entered service in 1946 to replace the Dragon Rapide, which is that one. So they'd gone from um, lots of bits of string, wire and um, canvas, and they went to this lovely aluminium frame Dove, which also used Redux. So they got experience in taking technology and applying it. So the Reduxing was quite a good way to take the weight out. Um, and they also, put in a whole load of stuff into this as a kind of tester. So flaps, they use a, const, a variable speed, um, constant speed propellers. They've got flaps for retractable undercarriage and, uh, and they've done some of this stuff which they'd learnt and could apply to the Comet. Redux was actually developed um, out at Duxford. Um, it was made up of a liquid phenolic resin at which they, you applied and it, it had a load of use. There was a lot of talk in the inquiry the subsequent Comet inquiry about whether the Redux had caused a lot of the issues. I think it's fairly safe to say from all the experience that they had with it, it was not the Redux. Although there's at least one expert witness who was absolutely convinced that it was. Um, I just took that slide in to say it wasn't that. It, there, it's been used by de Havilland, it's been in service with the Nimrod for more years than um, many of them have been flying, so it's not actually a problem and it, it also cropped up on a number of other aircraft. But some of the information around the airframe itself, 22 gauge skin, 0.71 millimetres thick for the, bulk, for the most of it. Around the windows, it went up to 0.91 mil thick, which is about common for 737s, most things are those kind of gauges. Certainly early 737s were all the same. Um, the UTS of the alloy, ultimate, ultimate tensile strength, is about 450 megapascals, so reasonably strong. And de Havilland estimated that the stressors would reach about 190 megapascals near the cutout, so near uh, escape hatches, windows, doors, ha everything else. Where they'd taken the chunk out and, had, and dealt with it, they reckon the stress would get probably up to about 190 megapascals, and that was where they started to uh, do their calculations. But to be honest, they, they didn't trust calculations. They preferred to actually test things, and we'll come on to that in a minute. Definition of fatigue at the time, Metals will break under a load which is repeatedly applied and then removed, although they can support a much larger steady load without distress, was about where it was in the mid-1940s when they started out on this um, journey. It's been known about, about as, a, as a failure mechanism for about 100 years, since some railway axle failures in the middle of the 1800s. Um, military aircraft had suffered quite a bit of fatigue on some of the wing structures, um, and there were some investigations during the war on that some RAE work on uh, fatigue of wing structures. So it was, it was known about, it was a problem, and people were trying to get their heads around it to see what, the, what they could do to deal with it. And de Havilland understood it. That was the typical kind of wartime construction. So aluminium, stringers, ribs, uh, riveted construction, and there was still fatigue in those kind of structures. So they were kind of used to that. The requirements of the day, when they started the design, was that the proof pressure that they had to take it to was one and a third of, the, of P. So that eight and a quarter PSI, one and a third of that 
pressurise the body. If it didn't explode or didn't stress or, or bend or whatever, then that was good. The design pressure had to be twice that. So if you think that 180 megapascals with, well, was well within the 450 um, of the ultimate tensile strength, so they felt they got those kind of safety, safety margins. But they actually used twice the proof pressure as a testing uh, method, method rather than one and a third, and two and a half times the, pressure, the design pressure was where they, they thought they could operate. So they actually put in safety margins above the, the legislation to see if they could cope with that. Now, they also spent a lot of time talking to the Air Registration Board, who would give them their certificate of airworthiness, and they wanted to know that uh, would that give them some kind of protection against fatigue. And it was just, fatigue was known. They, they kind of understood at the time that aluminium didn't particularly have a threshold, so it would continue to fatigue even at low stresses. But they didn't know how to design against it. And so both de Havilland's and the Air Registration Board and the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough all said, well, yeah, you kind of over-design over it, you'll be fine. Um, and that was the acceptable methodology. There was no other way of doing it. Now, there were some new draft requirements that came out in mid-1952. They were drafted in 52, issued in 53. The Comet's first commercial flight was in 52. So they, they, knew, they, they knew these were coming, and they said a static test to twice that pressure Proof test to one and a third, 15,000 applications of one and a quarter. So they started to look at fatigue in there. Structural parts would need to take three times that. So doors, windows, any cutouts would need three times that. Um, and they actually said that 15,000 cycles were seen as the, the, the design life of the airframe. If any aircraft ever saw 15,000 cycles, it was going to get pensioned off. Now that's fine, but we've seen Boeing 737s with 90 odd thousand cycles. Um, and that failed in fatigue as well. Um, <laughs> And the idea of the application one and a quarter P was to cover the scattering fatigue results. So they still didn't understand fatigue, but they were trying to do lots of stuff with stressing and loading and whatever to kind of fix the problem. Um, and it was still not well enough understood to enable an accurate lifing method methodology to be used. De Havilland actually got hold of two cabin sections. Well, they didn't need to get hold of them, they owned them. Um, two cabin sections. The forward sections, just under eight metres long from the nose to just in front of the... Um, uh, wing main spar, midsection, which covered the whole of the midsection over the, the wing main spar. And they basically stuck those in a, um, a chamber, flooded it with water, capped the ends, and pressurised it and depressurised it. Pressurized. And they did all the tests on these two sections. So it wasn't a whole airframe, it was two sections, um, both less than eight metres long, but they did that to it. And by July 1953, the forward section had seen 16,000 cycles and the flying comets had not exceeded 2,500 cycles. And when one of these finally failed, at just over that, they thought they'd got enough margin against the, the, re the regulations. They had fatigue tested these things to the point where they'd failed, and they thought they'd, they, they could then put the fleet up, or continue to have the fleet in service, because they were ahead of the game in terms of fatigue tests. Um, the sections including cutouts were proof tested to stresses higher than 2p, and De Havilland, there was lots of criticism of them about their design stressing, they did not calculate the precise stresses at the windows. They preferred to say, it's about this, but we'll test it and prove it. They preferred to actually do a test than, than, than rely on calculations. So, first flight of the de Havilland Comet, 27th of July, 1949. It had been a secret project. They built it in as much secrecy as they could muster. You had to have a pass to wander through, or there was one of the employees at the time said, if you stuck a file under your arm and walked like you meant it, you could get through the, uh, the, the hangar. And, and its first public display was in 1949. Um, the pilot on that first day was John Cunningham, who was the chief test pilot for the project. He was told, roll it out for the press, do a few runway kind of ups and downs, everybody will be happy, so he did. He rolled it up and down the runway a couple of times, the press took their photos, and then he thought, actually, everybody went home. About six o'clock in the evening, he was still, still doing runway trials, he thought, it feels quite good, let's see what it can do. And he took off at six o'clock in the evening. The world's press had all gone home apart from one photographer. They, 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 it took them years to forgive John for that one. The first ever flight of a commercial jet aircraft and it was after everybody had gone home. He said it flew beautifully. He, he didn't take, put up the undercarriage. He kept the undercarriage down, flew a loop. It was fine. He, 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 had, a, he had a great day. He, John, John loved the aircraft. He, he was one of the people I was privileged enough to meet. Um, he, was, he was a test pilot. He was also a night fighter pilot. His idea of danger is not necessarily the same as other people's. 
he tried to get out of a taxi at, in, the, in the middle lane outside some, um, King's Cross Station because he needed to catch a train. We tried to explain that the taxi's moving, you're in the middle lane, it's a busy road. His appreciation of danger was never quite what you'd... Anyway, um, but he was a chief test pilot. Um, broke many passenger records. It basically did point-to-point -point records, Rome, Cairo, uh, Copenhagen. It just did point-to-point. -point. The reason for this was that they didn't know if air traffic control was going to get completely scrambled by somebody turning up twice as fast as everybody else. All of a sudden, they got all these piston air engine aircraft turning up 200 miles an hour, 250 miles an hour. These things are going to turn up at 450 miles an hour into air traffic control holding patterns. Can air traffic control cope? So they actually did lots of mail carrying to different places to just prove they could get everybody to cope and handle this new, new technology. And it entered service 2nd of May, 1952. Yoke Peter, there it is on the runway at Heathrow. London to Joburg. Took off, um, w waved off, and it... it uh, shaved hours off the flight. I can show you some figures in a minute. Inaugurated the London to Tokyo service April 53. Took one and a half days still to get there. What's Tokyo? 13, 14 hours from Heathrow? Took one and a half days. 89% load factors for the first year. So every, really popular. Full aircraft. Everybody wanted to do it. The reason it took one and a half days was that it had to fly, um, or as it says, put UK industry at the forefront of aviation technology. The reason that it had to it took so long was that it had a range of 1,750 miles, which meant when you left London, the first place you landed was Rome. Um, you had to land at Rome because then you had to refuel. And then depending on where you were going, you could fly onto Beirut and land, re and, and you, you did this, these kind of two hour stages around the globe, and it still halved the journey times. Uh, or you went from Rome to Cairo, you went down to Joburg. And so that was how it happened. You basically flew in two hour stages around the world. And this, these were the, the routes that de Havilland focused on. BOAC were really pleased because it shaved hours, days off the journey time. It was halving journey times. It was taking 40% out of journey times. So people wanted to do it. They, they, they could get a day and a half of their life back by just actually catching a faster plane. So it was really popular. In, what, in one year, 370 hours per week, um, 122,000 miles. 20,780 unduplicated miles. But it also goes back to um, the major incidents were both from Rome. And you say, well, why Rome? Was there something to do with Rome Airport? It was looked at in the investigation where there was somebody sabotaging planes at Rome Airport. But the reason for Rome is every flight to and from London went through Rome. So you had no choice. Yeah, wh whichever way you were going, you were going through Rome. And it was just uh, a coincidence, unfortunate coincidence that it was Rome both times. There were a number of accidents. 26th of October 1952, Yoke Zebra, damage beyond repair on takeoff. The um, investigation found the nose was too high during um, takeoff, caused a stall. John Cunningham actually went in to try and replicate the situation with this, and he found out that what happens is all the pilots are converted from piston engine aircraft. And with a piston engine aircraft, what happens is you can open up the throttles, you get the engines working. When you get to kind of rotate speed, you can basically use the, the prop wash to give your wings lift and you haul yourself into the air using the propellers. When you've got gas turbines, you don't get the prop wash over the wings, they stall. You tip up too early, the wings enter a stall, and in this case, it ran off the end of the runway in a, in, in a stalled condition. And so John started to write the, the rule book that says you have V1, V rotate, V2 speeds. And so what's still used today by pilots was written by John to avoid situations like that. Unfortunately, this plane was on a bit of a race. Canadian Pacific Airlines were taking delivery of uh, CFCUN and they got as far as Karachi in what they were doing where they were attempting a record-breaking circumnavigation of the world. It was, it was dawn, the pilots were tired, they'd had short rest periods, long stage lengths. They, were, they, they basically got into there, it was dawn, they couldn't see properly, pulled back, and John said it was unfortunate. He could see all the marks of it. They got his tail, tail scraped down the runway. They got the nose down, but not in time. They ran off the end of the runway, hit a ditch, and the plane burst into flames. Then 2nd of May, 1953. Any conspiracy theorists out there like this one? Yoke Victor, crashed in a tropical storm, climbing westbound from Calcutta. People have always said, is this one of the first of the examples of fatigue? 
basically it took off from Calcutta, normal radio communications, uh, it was climbing, up, climbing out, then just disappeared. Broke up in, in midair, crashed. And it, people said, was it fatigue? The report says, too, storm too severe for the airframe, tail broke away. Actually, if you read the report and you look at the pictures, they're probably about right. The storm was quite a major storm. Nobody else was flying through it. Nobody wanted to fly through it. The pilot went through it, and unfortunately, it probably broke the tail off. Uh, judging by the impact damage, the tail probably went before the, the, um, the main airframe. So it wasn't pressure cabin fatigue that we, we came to know and love later. And then, 10th of January, 1954, Yoke Peter, that, that inaugural aircraft for the, from the uh, Joburg run, crashed into the sea after 1,290 pressurised flights. This was a major event. They, it crashed into the sea. Second unexplained, effectively unexplained crash at the time because the, the previous one had only been six months before. And basically, they grounded all comets. Um, the BOAC grounded them. And they started an, investi an investigation. But it crashed, flying out of Rome. It crashed into the sea. They picked up a few bodies, uh, mail sacks, uh, floating wreckage, seat backs, things like that, which they brought back to the UK. Um, but they had nothing really to go on. Uh, but Lord Brabazon chaired a committee which looked at all the changes that could be made. And they looked at all the different failure modes. They talked about a load of stuff that could have happened. They looked at engine failure, whether they could have thrown what they called a turbine. I'm not, whether it, I think they mean a turbine disc, but... Um, they've basically then strengthened the, the portion of the um, uh, airframe near, near the engines to make sure there was no puncturing in the pressure cabin. They went around all sorts of stuff. Uh, and uh, there are no, no definite reason for the accident has been established. They still had no wreckage, no, no way of finding it. Modifications are being embodied to cover every possibility that the imagination has suggested is a likely cause of the disaster. When these modifications are completed and have been satisfactory flight tested, the board sees no reason why passenger services should not be resumed. Flight services resumed 23rd of March, 1954. So it took them a couple of months to actually get to that state. Um, Yoke Yoke took off less than two weeks later, 8th of April, 1954. Took, took off from Rome, heading away. Um, it had had a bit of a, an interesting flight. It had been held up in Rome until 9 o'clock in the evening. It took off late. Uh, they'd had a problem with, uh, I think it was one of the, the bits of electronic equipment, and it was, was held over. I've actually got a photo of it taken that day by somebody who's actually, who actually came along to a talk and said, I've got a photo that his father took on that day at Rome Airport. The Italian policeman is rather irate that he was taking phone, uh, pho photos of the plane, um, but he's actually got a picture of Yoke Yoke before it took off that night. But he crashed into the sea. At which point, BOAC suspended all comet services. And the certificate of airworthiness was, was withdrawn, major step. 12th of April 1954. Ministry of Supply instructed Sir Arnold Hall as the director of the Royal, Establish Royal Aircraft Establishment to undertake a complete investigation of the whole problem presented by the accidents and to use all the resources at the disposal of the establishment. So that was the story and Sir Arnold Hall was called in and so they stopped a lot of other work and some people were rather cross because their projects got, got stopped or delayed and they looked at all of these different things and the the, the final report from the Royal Aircraft Establishment probably runs to three ring binders this thick of all the things that they looked at and reported out. And so it covered just about everything they could think of. Can they rebuild the wreckage of the original crash comet? Yoke Yoke crashed in even deeper water, so it was unlikely to be found. But Yoke Peter, reasonably shallow water, can they find some bits? Fatigue tests of the pressure cabin, that's kind of where we know with hindsight that's the, where the answer was, but that, at the time, they were looking at fatigue tests on wings, tailplane, static strength, damage. The refueling, the refueling for the comet was high pressure refueling. Could that have caused a problem? Could they have got fuel in a place they shouldn't and it caught fire? When Yoke Peter went down, they could, the fishermen said some, some of the bits were on fire. Could it have been something to do with that? Uh, also, they had flight investigations. They had another comet and they, they persuaded people to fly it and tell them what happened. Uh, miscellaneous investigations and medical aspects of the accident, which I will come back to. Uh, miscellaneous investigations included making models, firing, firing bits of models off top of hangars, um, filming exploding planes, all sorts. The two I'm going to focus on really today are the top two, because we know that's roughly where the, the thread that came through. But at the time, and um, talking to Sir Arnold Hall about it, he was very adamant that this wasn't the only strand that went on at that time. Every strand had equal importance. And actually, 
The tough bit was actually trying to get that one started, fatigue test on the pressure cabin, and it didn't get started straight away. And that's because he had to get hold of a comet, and they decided that what they were going to do was stick it in a big water tank as a whole aircraft. So they then had to build a water tank around it. They had rubber kind of bits around the wings to stop it leaking out. They built a steel structure around it. And he had to get two water tanks built, each holding nearly a million litres. And he had to get permission from the water company to take that much water out of the system. And that's why he had to build two tanks. There was a holding tank and a main tank, because he wasn't allowed to take a million, ta million um, litres out of the system every time he wanted to fill the tank. He had to pump it backwards and forwards between two tanks. They let him do it once, but not multiple times. So the idea was that they would use simulated flight cycles on the wings using hydraulic rams, and they, they basically had hydraulic rams on the wings, and they pressurised the cabin to simulate a flight cycle. And they knew that if they used water, it was incompressible, so any kind of damage, any cracks. Um, as they said at the time, if they'd used air, it was like a 500-pound bomb going off in the cabin. The evidence would be all over the, the field, so they were going to use water. And they basically flew that uh, simulated flight on the other plane, measured the loads from the other flights, and then did a simulated flight in five minutes. And that's the simulated flight cycle. So you've got this as a kind of what they, what they actually saw, and they imposed that on there with the flight cycle. And so in five, five minutes, you could actually do a complete uh, cycle of you know, the, the normal kind of two-hour flight. And that's what they did. And it kind of kicked off in about April it, um, with, with the building. They managed to get by May, June time, it was all up and running. Um, there was some poor gentleman that was, or a number of poor gentlemen, who were asked to actually sleep on camp beds in the pump house. How you slept in a pump house, I'm not sure, because the pump was going and everything was going off, but they basically ran it day and night. So they put Yoke Uncle in the tank. Um, they removed all the internal cabin fixtures and replaced them with lead weights. They didn't want soggy seating, so they kind of simulated that. It had, it had done a hundred, uh, one, 1,121 flights already, passenger flights, before they stripped it out. And it had done other, 10 other pressurised flights with de Havilland, and it managed 1,826 simulator cycles before fatigue failure. At about 3 o'clock in the morning, when the gentleman was awoken by the fact that he couldn't repressurise it, and then, because he'd been told to, phoned up Arnold Hall as director of the REE and woke him up. Um, and basically, he said, it's not pressurising, I think it's failed. Now this, to an extent, was a surprise. Total number of cycles completed, 3,000. De Havilland had a piece in another tank that had done 16,000 cycles. They had another piece, the, other, the bit that hadn't failed, it had done over 18,000 cycles at this point. So they had these two bits that had carried on, on running. They also went to put strain gauges on the comet and started to look at what the stresses were. And as they got closer to the windows, they suddenly realised that with 450 megapascals as the uh, ultimate um, tensile strength, they started to see some really high stresses, about 315, on a normal cycle, just because of the cutout. So they st started to you know, wonder about de Havilland stressing calculations. So they actually strain, you know, measured these, these stresses and tried to get a be better handle on them, and they turned out higher than they... De Havilland reckoned 190 megapascals, and this is up at 315. The other thing that they did was, Yoke Peter crashed in 600 feet, 183 metres of water. The Royal Navy, which was very helpful, um, was sent into the Mediterranean to find as much as it could. And this was the first use of underwater TV to find an aircraft wreckage. So they actually got a pod, stuck TV in it, dropped it down and started searching the seabed for bits. They knew roughly where it had gone. Um, the RE also made, they, they understood the breakup sequence to an extent from what was said by some of the uh, fishermen. So they had models where they put plugs in these models and as they threw it off the hangar, the plugs came out in a specific order and bits flew off and then they mapped out where it fell on the floor and sent the Navy into that point on the Mediterranean. And the Navy had quite a good job of it. I mean, 70% they, of the aircraft was located by September 1954. So it didn't work that badly. They did a really good job. Um, Yoke Yoke, though, was at rest depths well beyond anything they were going to do with uh, the, the Navy's uh, submersibles. So they gradually be rebuilt Yoke Yoke, and they noted similarities between Yoke Petra and Yoke Yoke, and that was that the flight profile was very similar, and the forensic evidence was very similar. 
And actually, they did medical forensics on both sets of passengers, and it turns out they both suffered from um, explosive decompression at altitude. Um, so that, and suffered from um, multiple uh, impacts with bits of the cabin on the way through. So, they got evidence of a breakup sequence for Yoke Peter. The tailplane plane separated fairly early in the whole sequence. Um, however, damage to the tailplane, there was a bit of carpet stuck in the leading edge. So they knew that the carpet had come out before the tailplane broke off. There was also a coin impact uh, somewhere around here that actually they could work out what the coin was precisely from the uh, impact of the coin on the tail. So they, they knew what uh, denomination and nationality of the coin. Um, so they knew the pressure cabin must have fell first because it chucked out all the interior. And they started to rebuild it on a frame, which kind of looks familiar to us now. Lots of investigations have done that, but this was a first in terms of trying to build up a whole model on a frame to put it back together again. And that's what they did. They wanted to track down what had failed first, and they knew it was the pressure cabin. The other thing that they went back through was um, de Havilland's manufacturing history, and they started to pull together all sorts of bits of information about that. Manufacturing cracks were found in the airframe itself and in other airframes. So both in Yoke Peter, which is this one, and in other airframes. Um, riveting was likely to cause cracks in the skin around the rivet holes. They punched the rivets through, small cracks were put in, and they, they, they cracked. On inspection, if they found them during manufacturing, they were stopped with a 1.6 millimetre drill. They were allowed to stop the crack, just drill a hole through the end of it. So they drill a hole through the end, make it blunt, not a problem. Except in this one in Yoke Peter, they drilled it, stopped it, and it still ran on. Um, some cracks were seen to go beyond the hole. Some did not. Some stopped, some didn't. So it was a known issue. But the sequence of the breakup, that was this is from the original report. They knew that it had started to fail about here, and it had opened up the, the pressure cabin. And unfortunately, as soon as the pressure cabin peeled open, the airframe was no longer a structural entity. The wings snapped, and the nose fell off, and the, and the tail broke in a downward motion. Um, they know that the wings failed in a downward motion because all uh, three out of four of the engines failed, uh, their shafts failed under gyroscopic loading as the, as the engines just tipped forward and the shafts snapped because they were still under load at the time. And this was the piece they found. This was found by fishermen uh, in about August 1954 and that was the roof of the pressure cabin and somewhere in there is the initiation and they could say that the crack started there and ran aft and it hit the window and ran forward, down and out and that's the, the, crack, the failure sequence as they got hold of it. Um, to show you some bit of fun, I'll pass this round. Um, this is actually a piece of comet skin, so you can see the thickness of it, you can see the rivet holes. We did find a manufacturing crack in one earlier. It's a bit tatty. This is actually Comet 1, um, taken off the, uh, the, the, the skin. So you can see the thickness, you can see the riveting. Um, that's the painted side, and that was on there. So if you pass that round. Um, it's, it's a real manufacturing piece. It's probably got a couple of sharp corners on, so no sticking it in your neighbour or whatever. So, RE went and looked at it, they found the breakup sequence, basically they got this probable origin of fatigue, it's actually at a bolt hole here, there were signs of fatigue, they could map it, they could look at it, they got it on the microscope, the opti optical microscope, looked at it and said yeah, signs of fatigue. This thing had spent a few months in the water, from January all the way through to August, it had sat at the bottom of the Mediterranean salt water, aluminium doesn't cope well, so it wasn't in great shape when it came up, but they said there were signs of fatigue. And so the RE opinion at the end of that was that it was um, structural failure on the pressure cabin brought about by fatigue. And they've reached that through a number of conclusions. The evidence of the breakup, the fact that Yoke uh, Uncle failed in the, in the tank test early. Um, they went through and they, they listed these. And it's, they also said that uh, same basic type as that produ producing the fatigue test, so everything seemed to tie up. And they said at the end, owing to the absence of wreckage, we were unable to draw a definite opinion about the, the other name, the yoke um, yoke accident. We draw the attention to the fact that the explanation offered for the above accident at Elba appears to be applicable to that at Naples. They put out that, that accident report in September 1954, and that was sent straight to the Court of Inquiry, which was set up, and the Court of Inquiry accepted the Royal Aircraft Establishment findings in terms of the cause. And actually, that was quite quickly de dealt with in terms of the, uh, the inquiry itself. So the crash of Yoke Peter was caused by fatigue failure of the cabin, Yoke Yoke was probably the same cause, and that was the first use of medical forensics to solve an air crash. So a number of firsts, not necessarily all wanted. Um, 
They, the Court of Inquiry also said that de Havilland, de Havilland were work, was working at or beyond the limits of knowledge, but had taken all precautions to prevent failure. So they actually went round, they interviewed a lot of the design team, they, they interviewed a lot of other experts from other companies, and basically said they, had, they were working beyond the, the, the knowledge of the day, and that fatigue was one of those things that had just come out and, and caught them, but they had done everything. They, they, They'd gone beyond the Air Registration Board's information and requirements to actually get this thing signed off. But sadly, it was the order they did the tests. Because if you remember going back, there was 16,000 cycles on one of those pieces. Why hadn't that failed? They did a 2P2 proof test on it before they started. That is not a requirement for an airframe. It was only a requirement that de Havilland did a 2P2 proof test on a part and a fatigue test. So they thought, we'll do the proof test first, then we'll fatigue it to failure, two tests. By doing a twice proof pressure test, they probably blunted all the cracks. And it then took a further 16,000 cycles to get them sharp and failing. And it was just the order they did the tests, operating beyond the limits of knowledge. Today we'd look at that and go, yeah, I can see that. Then, no idea. It is very easy to look back with hindsight and be critical of de Havilland with today's knowledge. It is very difficult to do it with the knowledge of the day and to actually read the textbooks of the time and say, from this information, could I have made a different choice? And Professor Murphy came out with possibly one of the comments of the inquiry. Enough is now known about the fundamental physics of fatigue for engineers to be aware there is still much to be learnt. Well, that's handy. <laughs> it's nearly as good as Donald Rumsfeld's unknown unknowns, isn't it? You know, we're in that kind of league. Right, so we get Professor Murphy's quote, but what, what do we know now? I mean, the general story, the accident was caused by fatigue failure of the airframe, square windows were the cause of high stresses. As a piece of information, the, the, the radius on those windows and the size of those windows was exactly the same to within about 5% of that of the Boeing 737, which is also a pressurised, and DC-9, and a number of other aircraft. There, there were no square windows. They were rectangular with rounded corners, as every other plane is. So, the fact that de Havilland put oval windows into their later marks was not because it was the squareness of the windows that caused failure. And it was all reported in the media. So what happens next? Well, the Royal Aircraft Establishment has managed to get their hands on a number of airframes out of BOAC. So they did all sorts of tank tests. They did, they did fatigue test after fatigue test. They blew Robert up, um, filled it full of water until it went pop. Um, they actually welded up all the windows and the doors and then filled it full of water to see when the, the rest of the cabin went. That was a really good pressure test. Um, the comets were no longer in service. So they, they basically used, used it as much as they could and they monitored stresses. So the Royal Aircraft Establishment generated a lot of data on aircraft structures. And they got charts like this, which is number of cycles uh, up there, pressure, pressure cycles, crack length. So they had maps of cycles against crack length, and they, they basically sat on these reports. They got lots of data. And that's just some of it. And they ended up putting more strain gauges on there. And You've got the rivet rows next to the windows, you've got the edge of the window frame, and you can see how the stress dropped down, and we can start to say, yeah, they did a lot of work. They, they basically pulled a, load, a lot of information off those airframes. But actually, the understanding of fatigue developed over the coming years. It was really a wake-up call to the, 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 kind of the scientific kind of groups. If, it could, if fatigue could take planes out of the air, then it needed to be something that we understood better. And so people started to work a lot more in fatigue, try to get some kind of understanding of it. Um, methods for relating crack, fatigue crack growth rates were to the instantaneous crack length apply and applied stress amplitude, published in 61. Paris and Erdogan pu published their law in 1963. So by 1963, you know, nearly nine years after the crash, we started to get the laws today that we would so readily apply to this kind of situation. And these empirical math methods are now applied to metals and alloys. Uh, DTD 546, the aluminium alloy was superseded and not particularly investigated further. It kind of disappeared and people took on other alloys. Now, if we were doing it today, we'd use the Paris Law. First published in 1963, 
by Paris and Erdogan, DADN is A delta K to the M, you know, so you, you've got your in instantaneous crack growth rates, so you can get that from this data and your stress <coughs> intensity factor, you can get your Paris exponent, that tells you how good your alloy is, and you can cr calculate uh, the fracture toughness from the failure stress data. So we could actually start to take, get some of this stuff that we've generated, the, the equations we've generated more recently, and apply it back to the original data, if we can get the data. Now, fracture toughness we've got, because RE tended to blow up, you know, see what, what, at what point the cracks started to run themselves. Unfortunately for DTD, there's little data. It wasn't tested in, a, in any kind of manner that's mostly useful, and so, as it fell out of use. So what do we have? We've got these fatigue tests that the Royal Aircraft Establishment focused on. So Yoke Uncle, Yoke Robert were, were tested and patched up and tested and patched up. So every time they found a fatigue crack growing, it got to a particular length, they stopped it, they carried on. Strain gauge from those tests and evidence of the rebuild from Yoke Peter. We've got all this data. Um, and so we can start to say, well, if we get this data that RE had of number of cycles against crack length, which they had a, for a number of different cracks, probably somewhere in the region of 10 cracks that were well documented. We've also got the stressing from those strain gauges. So we can work out the stress range that we've got because we, we now know exactly how long the cracks were from the previous ones and we know the, 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 the strain gauge data to give us stresses. So we're starting to build some kind of uh, story about wh what we can get. Now, on the comet, the fuse large diameter was about 3.2 meters. Skin thickness varied and the cabin between about 0.7 and 0.9 millimetres, cabin pressure of 59 megapascals. So we can start to get, if we treat it as a tube, we can start to work out the hoop stress of 128 megapascals, slightly higher than the measured general stress of 69 megapascals found during the RE work, but that's not really a surprise because you've got ribs and stringers in there, so you've taken some of the stress out with the design of the aircraft. Five cracks were allowed to go to failure, totally between 149 and 180 millimetres, which gives us a fracture toughness of about 50 megapascal root metres. And so we can start to say, we've, we can work out how, what, what was the K1C of these, this particular alloy. And if we then start to say, well, using the data available, we, we, we can calculate delta K, the stress intensity factor. A is the crack length. Treat it as a single crack at a hole in an infinite sheet, because it's easier. Under biaxial loading, hoop and longitudinal stress. Uh, the stress range can be calculated from the measurements in stress in the tank test. That does vary with distance from the window, so you have to factor that in and that, so that varies with crack length. And if you do all of that, so you add those two bits of data together, you can start to get a chart that looks a bit like that with the scattered data. So if we then say, we've got this tank test data, Yo, uh, Yo Kunkel and Yoke Roberts, using that data, we can take longs of both sides. I've realized I've, what, what I need to do. That's the line through it, by the way. Um, that tell, I've seen worse data with a line plotted through it, but it, it's not great. But that's the data we've got, and I, I can't actually find any more data. Um, so using the, the, the data from the 1950s, we can calculate the Paris exponent is M for the material is, is about five, which isn't too bad for kind of a material of that, <coughs> that nature. Fracture toughness of around 50 megapascals, so it's slightly worse than a material of today, but not cripplingly so that you'd start to worry that the material wasn't up to it. However, initial cracks were likely to be very small, less than a millimetre in size. So right start, starting out at the start of the journey, that's how big they'd have been. Um, therefore, difficulty in, to identify on inspection. The initial manufacturing crack on Yoke Peter was likely to be hidden under the bolt head. So you work your way back and you see that it wasn't a great uh, thing to, to look at. That's actually the roof from Yoke Peter. It's actually in the Science Museum store. Uh, it's the only bit of the comet they kept after they closed the investigation down. And so that spent a number of months at the bottom of the Mediterranean. Um, they pulled it back out. This is actually not a great replica. I've got better ones, but I don't hand them around. This is actually the replica of the bolt hole, the bigger lump, and the fatigue crack running off it. If you want to have a quick look at that. So that's, that's a replica of the actual crack from Yoke Peter. Um, So looking in that area, the, there's, a double, there's a plate that it was stuck to after the investigation, but that's the crack in there, that's the bolt hole, and that's, that's the, in blue is the, the, the inverse of that. You get it on the SEM, 
and you start to see, well, what's happened? You've got this growth direction, you've got possible striations, possible striations, I'd say. It was, yeah, with, yeah, anyway, with a bit of imagination. Um, but that's the backing plate. But basically, the fatigue crack, crack grew down and went off a fast fracture. So we know it failed uh, after that point, and that was the limit of the fatigue crack. We actually get to the other end, and it's not great, but this is the chamfer, that's the bolt hole, so that's just a hole. This is the chamfer that the bolt hole sat, that was made around the bolt hole. And even though the skin thickness was only kind of 0.9 of a millimetre, there was a chamfer on the, on the bolt, it was flush fitting for aerodynamic reasons, and so you had this little crack that probably is about this big before the crack turned in the direction of major stress. And that's probably it there. So you've got this kind of, the chamfer, the, the pre-crack, that was put in during manufacture before it just ran off in fatigue. And so you've got this little area of fatigue that really was the kickoff of the, the whole yoke peter failure. So the initial defect around the bolt hole was about 1.5 millimetres long. So not great at all and probably couldn't be seen because not only was it under the bolt head, it was also painted over and it was also on a doubler plate that was underneath something else. So apart from that, it was really good to find. And we knew that these cracks were there the rivets have been pushed through, causing cracks the way they did them. They, they pop, pop the rivets through, they crack them under the, the heads. That piece of skin's got at least one in there that's gone round. Um, cracks could develop at the window rivets. They grew towards the window and stopped, usually. You had two lines of rivets and you ended up with a really interesting kind of stopping mechanism. If they were on this side, they grew to the window and stopped and they, were, they weren't long enough to fail the aircraft. So if they, were, if they grow the other way, they tended to grow into the next hole, the next rivet hole, and stop anyway. So actually, a lot of the cracks that they found either grew to the window and stopped or grew to another rivet and stopped. And so it was only if you had a crack that grew away from the second row of rivets that it didn't have anything to stop it. Otherwise, it self-stopped. Self Critical crack length needed to get up to 165 millimetres. And so that was reasonably easy to spot if it was in clear skin. Problem was the bolt hole on Yoke Peter was 90 millimetres from the window. It was a bolt hole up for other purposes. The cracks grew both forward and after the bolt hole. They grew to the window and probably aft as well. And at that point, they grew beyond the critical limit. It was also under a doubler plate, so they wouldn't have found it. It was also on the ADF window, which was the aerial direction finding window, which was on the roof. So it was on the roof of the plane, under a doubler plate and a coat of paint. So they'd, if you tried to look at it from the inside, there was all the cabin, li there was the cabin insulation and the cabin lining, so you couldn't, you, there was no access easily to that part of the aircraft. It's also only done a few thousand, you know, less, less than 2,000 cycles. So it hadn't done enough cycles to actually get to a place where it was going to be stripped and inspected. So it ran forward and aft. It was just that Yoke Peter was, had a crack that grew in just the wrong place at the wrong time. So, some modern analysis. If we start with the calculated Paris equation, we've got those from that scattergun data. And if we substitute in for delta K of that, and we just assume that it's the single crack in infinite sheet, and we kind of substitute back in, we end up with that equation. And so we end up you know, feeding all the data in, crack growth rates per cycle. We've got this big factor here, the stress range to the power five, and then a crack growth rate. We rearrange, we can get that. And then integrating, we get that. Straightforward to do it, just a bit messy. And so we end up gathering all the terms together. We get the crack length on that side, we get the stress on this side, and we can start to see exactly where we got to. And we can use the hoop stress, which can be calculated. The initial crack length was 1.5 millimetres. The final crack length, probably about 165 millimetres total crack length from the investigation. You feed the beast and you get a life for yoke peter of 1,272 cycles. Yoke peter crashed on the 1,290th flight. Didn't fiddle that. Um, is, but that's how the numbers came out. Assuming that the crack length that I saw on the SEM was 1.5 mil was the number that I fed into there to get that data. And so by just feeding that into standard Paris law equations, we end up with a, a life that isn't far off what Yoke Peter actually saw. So the plane itself 
behaved exactly as we expected it to. It did everything we expected and failed just at the wrong time. So you kind of look at it with kind of modern eyes, pressurised cabin brought about you know, fatigue. I'm not disagreeing with the 1954 findings. The punch riveting rather than drill, drill rivet and glue is one of the causes. And actually the upgraded windows, the designer of the aircraft actually was asked whether he would rivet the windows or he'd redux them when he was first designing the plane. And he remembers many years later, he remembered the guy coming into his office and saying, do we redux it or do we rivet it? And he said, the windows, the rectangular windows, the fixturing for reduxing is going to be really expensive, we'll rivet them. De Havilland went to oval windows on the subsequent marks because it was easier to redux them in, nothing to do with the stress concentration. And it's purely to remove rivets. Nothing to do with the shape of the windows, as I say. The shape of the Comet windows is very, very similar to that on every other jet aircraft that's ever flown, up to Boeing 787. So the bolt hole which failed on yoke piece had the defect in the chamfer, which indicate uh, the potential for manufacturing defects on all skin holes. And the interaction between the stress and the manufacturing defects was probably beyond any knowledge they had in 1950s. So I agree that that was the, the way it, it worked out for them. I don't disagree with the findings, and it's interesting that modern analysis actually takes you to a place where, had they been able to do it themselves, they probably could have sorted out the stressing. It was just nine years too early. The Comet 4, the Comet 2 and 3 were actually in development at that point and were scrapped because they, both, they had this uh, shape of windows and they, set, they scrapped them off. Comet uh, through the Comet 4, different window design to reduce riveting, fewer manufacturing cracks, that's always a good start. And it was the first airliner to fly scheduled service across the Atlantic on the 4th of October 1958. Again, de Havilland went and upset somebody by doing that. Um, Pan American were going to fly a 707 and they, with big announcement they said, passenger service will start across the Atlantic back end of October 1950, uh, 1958. De Havilland had a quiet word with BOAC and said, could you slip, slip, a, slip a service in from early October? And they went, oh, all right then. <laughs> And they did. And, and the Americans, who had done this fanfare of the first jet service, kind of came second. Um, sadly, it was with the 707, higher capacity, and the rest is history. But Boeing has, has dominated since. But the aircraft itself remained in service as the Nimrod 60 years after the first flight. So the wings, the tail, um, and some of the fuselage sections actually re re were re retained. And some of the design features, like having the engines in the wing routes, uh, were really, really useful for maritime reco reconnaissance. Because putting them close to the centre line of the plane meant that the, uh, the RAF could actually turn off three out of the four engines when they were just circling over the Atlantic at slow speeds. They didn't need to burn the fuel. It wasn't so far out that they were sitting on a wing and it would give them a massive turning moment and a handling problem. So they just cycled which engine they turned off, well, turned on, and, and that, that extended the life of the aircraft. So that was a quick jaunt through the comet.